We do love you. <laughs> Thank you. Come on, get it all out now. Come on. <laughs> get it all out. Because y'all not going to be screaming and yelling while I'm up here talking. So go on and get it out. Because <laughs> we do love you. Thank you. So, so excited to be here tonight. I, I could not, this is the easiest yes, and I'm, I'm telling you, I said no a lot lately. <laughs> <laughs> this was the easiest yes that I have given in a long time. I'm mm -hmm. so excited to be here. Thank you. This, yes. Um, this book has done things to me. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and and I'm gonna, I wanna jump right in, but, I said I had to do this before I jumped in yep. because I haven't seen you in a while. Yeah, we haven't. It's, it's yeah. been, you know, everything is like pre and post pandemic. <laughs> 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 but I haven't seen you in a while. And I said the very next time I saw you that I wanted to give you your flowers publicly. And I'm so glad it's this kind of forum because there's a thing that people don't know about our relationship mm -hmm. that you probably don't even remember as a thing. But in 20... 18, it feels like in 20, back in 20. But when we met, mm -hmm. we had a good time. Yep. <laughs> we were hanging out. Yep. That's none of your business. <laughs> but, <laughs> mm -hmm. and you said to me, um, I want to support you. You know, oh, yeah. we were talking to uh -huh. and mm -hmm. it was me, you, and a couple of other people, and you said, I want to support you. And a lot of people say that. Mm -hmm. And because it was in a like, relaxed atmosphere, I just was like, oh, I would love that. And we didn't exchange information really. Mm -hmm. And you found me somehow. Uh huh. And mm -hmm. you were the first celebrity in Hollywood to write a check for us. Oh. <clears throat> and, mm -hmm. and I'm saying that, I want to say that publicly because that was a very big deal. That was before any, literally anybody. Mm -hmm. And we hear a lot about the white ladies. Yes, we, we hear a lot about the this and that. We hear a lot about mm -hmm. the people who said that time was running out or time yes, was absolutely. running out or was up mm -hmm. or whatever. But before that happened, <laughs> before that happened, you, looked me, you took me by the hands and you said, I want to support you. Yeah. And you figured out how to do that. And you said, I'm going to get other folks to support you. I did. And you ran down a list and you said, this person didn't write a check? That person didn't write a check? And I text them. And you did. <laughs> and she did. And then them checks came. <laughs> <laughs> and I haven't had a chance to look you in your face to say thank you for that. Oh. 100% you're welcome. <laughs> My pleasure. Yeah, because I don't think people realize that we, I have a public figure, but my work doesn't get that kind of support. Exactly. That other people's work get. I understand. So, thank you. You are welcome. All right, so. Now let's get into this. Yeah. Because you have been doing some other work. <laughs> yes. Um, and I, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and take these glasses out, so just... Take your pictures now. <laughs> Don't put these pictures on Instagram, y'all. Okay. Those are cute glasses. Thank you. Yeah. I, I bought the cute ones because I know folks don't listen. They're cute. <laughs> <laughs> My mother picked these out. Hey, mommy, I know you're here somewhere. Um, okay. So I've heard you say in interviews that um, you wrote this book during the pandemic. I did. Yeah. And you've told pieces of your story over the years, and we've heard, lots of us yeah. have heard bits and pieces of your story, but you've never revealed this level of detail. And frankly, with your level of success, you never really had to, right? You mm -hmm. could have lived the rest of your life never um, giving us this yeah. much detail about you. Walk us through how you came to this decision to write this book and, and share so much of the trauma you experienced as a child. You know, I think that that question has been the question that I've been most afraid of because there are times when I'm thinking, I, I actually don't know. <laughs> but, then, um, but then I do know. I just felt like I had the, 
the worst existential crisis. Mm. I had a serious crisis of meaning during the pandemic. And it was a culmination of ending how to get away with murder and you know, finally when you're busy, 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 and you stop, <laughs> and then you stop, and then the pandemic happened and George Floyd happened and Ahmaud Aubrey happened and Breonna Taylor happened, mm -hmm. and then COVID happened and that really shit fest of a, um, of a election happened. Ooh. And then people were exposed and everyone was exposed and then all of a sudden, I just felt like what I compare it to, and I know it's a really messed up analogy, but I'm in the business of analogies. I, am, I imagine myself as like the first person who was ever on earth alone, mm. standing in front of an ocean and the sky and the mountains before language was created, before psychology, before you knew that this was a heartbeat and these were feet, before any companionship or love, how do you make sense of your existence? How do you communicate it? How do you name yourself? How then do you go on with life? Who are you grateful to? That's how lost I felt I was. I'm not gonna lie. Mm -hmm. It's like I wanted someone to show me something. You know, what are we here for? Are we honestly looking at a man who is being murdered on TV and we're debating it? And then with me, I'm thinking, so is fame it? So with all of that, I felt like with anything, it's just like when you know, your cell phone is, is being messed up, what do you do? You turn it off <laughs> and you leave it off for a while mm -hmm. and then you turn it back on again yeah. and it's renewed, right? That's what I felt like when I had, I felt like I had to go back to the eight year old Viola. Mm. That Viola that I sort of left in Central Falls, you know? Um, I felt like she could tell me something, you know? Um, <laughs> and um, that's, what I, that's why I wrote my story. Sometimes when you tell your story over and over again, you, you have your aha moments of meaning, of purpose. And that's why I wrote the book. But I felt like if I wrote it, Viola, you gotta write everything. You gotta leave it all on the floor. So it. that's what I did. You, <clears throat> you, <clears throat> so you have this, you did leave it all on the floor, girl. You, you have this great line in, um, in the chapter, Taking Flight. Mm -hmm. uh, you said, I had the persona of being real because I didn't know what or who else to be. But being real and being transparent are two totally different things. Being real is wearing $15 shoes and being proud to wear them. Being transparent is saying, I'm always anxious. I never feel like I fit in. I need help. I wasn't transparent. Do you feel like this book has helped you be more transparent? And why is that important? I think that that is probably the only way to live a life. And I wish there was some other way. I really do. I wish there were some shortcuts. <laughs> but I feel that, um, I feel that when you get to the end of your life, my new favorite saying is, I want to be brave. Mm. And I don't want to stumble into my grave saying that I wasn't brave enough. Mm. Because what is a legacy other than your truth, right? What is a legacy if you don't leave crumbs for people to live better? And I feel that um, we have become untethered. We have been, and we have disconnected yeah. from ourselves and each other because we don't want to be transparent. 
Yeah. Everything online is about being the boss bitch. <laughs> it used to be about, you know, back in the day, if you got a job, you know, and you, you know, you bought your, your first house and you had your two kids, that was enough. Now it's about generational wealth. <laughs> it's about, you know, working 18 hour days and meeting yeah. each other in exhaustion. It's about all the external sort of factors Great of things. success. Mm -hmm. But then where do you go if you need a rope? Mm -hmm. I don't want to contribute to that narrative. Yeah. I don't. And I don't know, I, I personally don't know, I keep thinking about this line, because I think I have it in the book, the Anne Lamont line. I think so. Is you can either leave something for people or you can leave something in people. And I feel like that leaves something in people to show up and be seen, mm -hmm. to say, I know that you see me marching and giving these speeches with my fist up, but when I go home, there are times when I don't feel value. Mm -hmm. There are times when I feel anxious. So guess what? When you feel anxious, you know it's okay. See, sadness, failure, Anxiety, joy, peace, success, all operate on the same plane. Mm -hmm. Then the, 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 the sadness and the anxiety and all of that is not a detour to your destiny. It's a part of it. Right. Right. And right. that's why I want to be transparent because, listen, I don't have a cape. Okay. I don't have any capes in my house. And I don't want one. <laughs> I really don't. Okay. No capes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we anti-cape. <laughs> Seriously, I'm not flying anywhere. I want to walk. <laughs> in fact, if you want to carry me, I'll take that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I said my mother's here. Mommy, where you at? Right here. Hey, mom. Hey. So your mother, like mine, is one of your personal heroes. Yes. Uh, you write so powerfully about her in, in the book. Yes, my I mama. do. May Alice. Oh, yes, May Alice. May Alice is something my, else. My mama. Yeah. Was, it mama, was it my mama, right? Yeah, my mama. My mama. My I mama. loved it. Mm -hmm. Y'all just got to read this book. It's good. Anyway. Um, and I love y'all from, you from, you were born in South Carolina, but raised in Rhode Island, mm -hmm. which is such a jump. <laughs> Ooh, but you, you, you speak so powerfully, you write so powerfully about her. Talk to me about your relationship with her. And has she read the book? No, she has not read the book. Oh, okay. Because mm -hmm. uh, I wondered about that. It, it took me a long time to have my mom read my book. Mm -hmm. But talk to me about um, your relationship with her. And what's, the, what, what's that like now? I feel like it's a love affair. I feel like I'm being introduced to her for the first time. Mm. So because I can ask her questions from an adult perspective yeah. instead of a child perspective, which is you may think it, but you know you don't say it, yeah. you know? <laughs> so now I can actually ask her questions that are a little bit more um, risque. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and I can challenge her. Can I challenge you, mommy? Now, now usually when, now let me tell you. Now let me tell you, usually, usually when I challenge her, I'm, I'm on the phone. On the phone, exactly, exactly, exactly. Viola said, don't get beat up on my account. Yeah. I mean, I challenge her on the phone, but um, it's a love affair. Yeah. Because now, I, I don't care what anyone says, you know, once you get older, you really, you really value mm -hmm. your mom. Every day. You count it all joy. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Absolutely. One of the most powerful quotes in the book for me was, success pales in comparison to healing. That just, it was, I, I kept coming back to that, I outlined it, it was such a good quote. 
Talk to me about what healing has been like for you as a person who has experienced so much success in the face of trauma. You know, they're two different things. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, success really, listen, I, and you know, take what I'm about to say with a grain of salt. I'm in very, very grateful for my life. I understand. I really am. I'm grateful for the awards. I'm grateful for all of it, but, and I do feel like it was hard work, mm -hmm. but a huge part of it was luck too and blessings Absolutely. and explain luck to anybody. <laughs> healing for me is something totally personal mm -hmm. and healing can only happen, happen when you examine your life, when you unpack everything piece by piece and look at it examine it and make revelations. And sometimes that takes a lifetime. Mm -hmm. I always say, well, I've been saying lately, <laughs> because I have to tell you in the book, there were a few things that I took out and I put back in and I took out and oh, yeah. I put back in, oh, yeah. took out again. I'm gonna get to that. I mean, <laughs> oh my God, but I really, really believe that life is a relay race. Mm -hmm. And I used to say that life is a relay race with, you know, you, you run your leg of the race and you pass a baton to the next generation <laughs> and they run and they give it to the next generation and that's what you do. That's a social media response. <laughs> that's my social media response. <laughs> the relay race is you. It's you when you're younger and getting through, for me, that trauma, surviving it. And little Viola survived it. She said a lot of cocksucker motherfuckers, but she you survived so it. Did. <laughs> Baby. <laughs> but then she, and then that six year old Viola passed a baton to the 14 year old Viola who said, I want to be an actress. That's what I'm going to be. I see a vision of, in, in, in my, of my life, I see a portal, I'm gonna pursue it. And that 14 year old passed it on to the 28 Viola who graduated from Juilliard, who finally realized that, oh my God, I graduated from Juilliard, now I'm out being an actress, but I don't know anything. I'm gonna destroy every relationship in my path. I have no awareness of myself. So let me go into therapy. And she passed it to 34 year old Viola who got married and said, I have love in my life. I have to honor it, but I have to even inject it with some healthy behavior and some knowledge that I'm bringing my baggage, he's bringing his. I want this love to last. And that Viola passed it on to the 45 year old Viola who became a mom for the first time and had to then raise a child. And then that Viola passed it on to me. Now, at 56 years old, now 56 is different than six, is different than 14, is different than 28. Mm -hmm. So at this point in my life, now what? And now what? Because I'm not at midlife anymore. I'm a little past midlife. <laughs> no, seriously. <laughs> I hear you. And so what is it? You know, I say that in my book too. May I live long enough to know why I was born. Hmm. And that is, once again, it brings me back to acting. When you create a character, the first thing you have to figure out is what a character needs. And the character's needs are real simple. They wanna be loved. I wanna have control. For me, I actually want people to feel less alone. If, if actually I could do that, I'm good with that. Mm. I mean, I know that my husband and daughter know that I love them. I'm, all, I'm gonna do that. Mm -hmm. But if I were to think for any, being alone, especially during the pandemic, are you freaking kidding me? <laughs> it was horrific. And I'm thinking to myself, I know all of y'all are feeling alone too. What can we do to connect with each other? What can we do to come together? 
and no one seemed sort of interested in that. <laughs> so, yeah, I forgot the question. I went on and on. Oh, and it's on. fine. <laughs> Listen, you, it was in there. It was in there somewhere. <laughs> I, I, I want to go back in your race really quickly, little that you just laid out, because you have to talk. Just tell this one story from the book. It's not. It's not oh a bit God. of a story. Dang, should you tell it? You got to tell it. You have to tell it. The Juilliard audition is one of my favorite parts of the book. Oh my God. <laughs> because you have to think to yourself, because I'm going to think to myself, if you ever forget how much of a badass you are, <laughs> you have to stop and think some days, because you didn't allow yourself to think it when it happened. Yeah. So do you ever go back and think to yourself, maybe you ain't a boss bitch, because I hate that too. Mm -hmm. But she was a badass. <laughs> That Juilliard audition, and, and it's so quintessential black woman, we do things, we do what we have to do mm -hmm. out of necessity, mm -hmm. and we just keep it moving. Exactly. Please tell the audience about your Juilliard audition. When I think about that story, I think it, it is pretty badass. Oh, I don't even know if I would absolutely. do that now. You probably but, um, wouldn't because you'd think about it because you weren't yeah. thinking then, you were just doing it out of necessity. But please, just tell them real quick, two seconds, go ahead. <laughs> You want me to tell him? I'll tell him. No, I... <laughs> <laughs> I was doing a play in Providence, and 7.30 is your half hour call to go to the theater. But I had to audition for Juilliard, so I had a small window of time where I had to get on the train, four hours, go to New York, audition, and get back in time for my 7.30 curtain, okay? I didn't know the Juilliard audition really lasted a week. <laughs> so I went to Juilliard, and in hindsight, I see myself with my head wrap that was silver, gold, purple, red. It was all kinds of shit happening in that headscarf. And a big purple sweater. No, it was a big red sweater. Some big jeans. They were really like, yeah, big jeans. And I went with my audition. It was Miss Seeley from Color Purple. And it was a classical piece, Martine from The Learned Ladies by Moliere. And I was like, I'm great. <laughs> now, I don't think anything like that now, but that time I said, Mom, great. So I went in and I auditioned. And I took my scarf off for the audition, which I'm surprised I did that because I don't know what was going on underneath that scarf. But I, I took the scarf off, I did my audition, and I felt like they were enthralled. But then I felt really nervous because I got to get back for 7.30. So I said, um, excuse me, but um, I need to know now if I'm in the school. Because I only have... I only have 45 minutes before I have to go back to Providence to make my 7.30 call. <laughs> so if y'all could get together and decide whether I'm in the school or not. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. I know that wasn't supposed to be a comic relief, but I, I laughed so hard when I got to that. I was not laughing because at the time. I know you weren't laughing, and I know you didn't mean it, but I was like, only a black woman who got somewhere to go <laughs> would tell Juilliard. <laughs> because the other part in the book she's describing, that all the, these, these students who have worked their entire lives to get into this school. And there was all these white students there, right, who were classically trained and all these- Doing their vocal doing exercises. Their, yeah, you know, and, I'm you, and I'm thinking about like fame and, you know, and here comes Viola <laughs> up in there with her headscarf on. She's like, hey y'all, I know y'all got things to do, but listen, <laughs> I don't have three days, I got a train to catch, so. <laughs> but here's the part that I love. She was so good that they got them cheers together, they pulled them teachers, and they pulled together a little group, and they said, Ms. Davis, can you come in here? And they auditioned her in 45 minutes, what they would have done in three days, and yeah. said, you're in. Yeah. So, I love that story so much. So I just, all right, so let's get back on track. I'm sorry, I just love that story so much. You had to, you, you had to tell them that. You got to get the book to read the rest. <laughs> but your entire life, from, from childhood, people have been trying to negate your blackness. 
including in Juilliard, right? I mean, you got in, but then it was a whole nother journey um, in one way or another, whether it was those ignorant children in your school, the curriculum at Juilliard, um, and you, or in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And you have emerged as a powerful voice for black people, particularly black women, both on and off the screen. How did your journey to finding you also underscore the importance of amplifying the breadth and depth of blackness in as many ways as you can? I don't think that there's any way of separating me from my blackness. Absolutely. So that's like the journey of me. Mm -hmm. And can I just say that I don't know if I have been in any space where I can be absolutely honest and real and know that it's being received in terms of talking about being a dark-skinned woman in America. You just, it's, it's completely negated, even by black people. Mm -hmm. I mean, you feel like there are, there, are, there are people who you feel hold press conferences to talk about how unattractive we are. There are people who find that there's no problems. I, I've had friends, actually, or so-called friends in the past, who find it absolutely, without question, in the middle of a conversation, just saying, you know you're not attractive, right? <laughs> and hmm. I don't think that we understand how race has affected us so deeply and intricately. Mm -hmm. I think that, listen, we had Ahmaud Aubrey, Breonna Taylor, we had George Floyd, and we can, we, oh, we have seen, I, I've gone to the lynching museum, mm -hmm. Brian Stevenson's Montgomery. lynching mu museum in Montgomery, I, I've been to Memphis, so we understand that pain. Mm -hmm. We understand the, the pain of, of families and communities having to watch you know, black people being lynched and hung and, and drive-by shootings. But that's not the extent of the pain. The pain is way more complicated than even that. Mm -hmm. And my big thing as a black woman, and you know what? I'm going to say it. I'm going to make it plain. Make it plain. Because, and it is my ego. And I know ego is, I know the ego is false, but it's very human. But there's a part of me that bubbles over with rage when I cannot bring my womanhood in the room with me. Come on. Because I know, I know that you're going to reject it. That somebody over the course of history has said that you have no value because we don't find you beautiful. But is that your ego, no. though? Is that your ego? I think we have a right to that as black women. I do feel like we have Absolutely. a right to that. I, I do, yes. Yeah. I do feel like we, we do have a right to that. But, there's a, the, but there is a part of me that feels like I'm fighting for my space. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. I'm, I'm fighting for it. And, and after a certain point, I, I didn't know that maybe, just maybe, Viola, what was told about you was a lie. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's, that's, absolutely. Yeah. That's why it's not your ego, though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's, why, that's why it's not your ego. That's the, that's the truth coming out. That's not your ego. It's what you deserve. What you deserve is going to come to the surface at some point. Well, absolutely. So it's not your ego, it's your birthright. Yes. And so when your, bir your birthright is going to come to the surface at some point, and your birthright is fighting to say, this is what I deserve. Yeah. And so what you, do, when you're, what you deserve comes to the surface, it's going to fight for, for air. That's your birthright fighting for, for breath. And you deserve to come into a room and be recognized for what you are, which is beautiful. Absolutely. So that's true. not ego. Absolutely, Toronto. That's not, I, no, yeah. I believe you. And when you're in those spaces with other black people I, and I, you're still fighting it, I'm, that's an that what you believe is because what happens in, in a room when you're saying, okay, well, this is how I feel 
as a black woman. Yeah. And so then, you know, the inevitable comment is, oh, I feel the same way. You know, I mean, look at my long blonde hair. You know, I've, I've, I've always felt like I was, look at what Betty Friedan wrote in The Feminine Mystique. Um, she wrote that, you know, we weren't allowed to put our names on credit cards. You know, we weren't, yeah. you know, we weren't, you know, and you just want to say, like, listen, I'm, I'm standing here. Yeah. I'm serious. I, I, I love you. <laughs> but it's, it's not the same not thing. The same. And so then you either have to keep fighting and fighting until they hear you or see you. Or what you do is you shut up yeah. or you do something to me that's worse. You assimilate. Yeah. And, I, and I didn't want to do that. So let me ask you this, because in your book, the part that made me sad, mm -hmm. one of the parts that made me yeah. sad, but then also made me um, feel good was when you talked about getting the role of Annalise Keating. Yeah. You, you, I'm not gonna, I'm not, I may or may not binge watch How to Way, Get Away with Murder when I feel away. I may or may not have watched <laughs> many, many episodes that's not relevant to this conversation. But <laughs> when you talked about getting the role and how good you felt and then how immediately people said things that were awful about whether or not you should have that role yeah. because of the way the role was described as a person who was sexy and who was, uh, I forgot the word, whatever these words that they would use mm -hmm. that were supposedly not attributed to you because you were Viola Davis. And I know that feeling. I know that feeling really, really intimately. Um, but you had an epiphany when going through yeah. the ups and downs of should you have that role. Talk about that a little bit. And I, and I just want to say this because colorism and featureism mm -hmm. is something that's a thread throughout your whole life. Absolutely. And throughout this whole book. And we don't talk about it enough because we get it com coming from the outside and from the inside. And you handle it in, a, in really beautiful ways, particularly around this role. It's interesting. It's like I would love to talk about why we don't talk about it. I think that that's an interesting <laughs> conversation. Girl, we can have a whole nother. Yeah. <laughs> Well, here's the thing. I feel like social media has bogarted the whole definition of what it means to be an actor. Mm. And how they bogarted it is by, there is a filter, a reductiveness to movies and television sometimes. Mm. And the reductiveness is in giving you an image that you want to see. Mm. It's not honest. It's not truthful. It doesn't look like you. It's all under the headline of that word, escapism. Hmm. And so every lead woman, she's got the hair, she knows how to walk. She is classically beautiful. She's all of those things. You don't know who the hell she is. <laughs> now, <laughs> there's a part of me that feels like that part of entertainment has infiltrated even our culture, mm -hmm. even politics. Oh, absolutely. We want to be entertained. We don't know the difference between Thursday night lineup and, and a political debate or a, a, an election or, or even a life. Mm. We see the complexity of someone's life and say, just do A, B, and C and get it over with. Mm. Okay, but I, I want to say that, <laughs> the reason why I want to say that is it has nothing, let me repeat, nothing to do with acting. Mm. Acting is about creating a human being. It's about studying life so that when the audience comes in and they're going through whatever they're going through, they can go, oh my God, me too. Mm. Now what happened to me when I got How to Get Away with Murder? And I know for a fact, one of the executives, after I even got the role, said, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. Can we see maybe some tape of Viola looking glamorous? 
And I'm glad my reps didn't listen to that. But when I got Annalise, the first few days of filming, I was falling into that. I really was trying. I was trying to walk a certain way. I was trying to look a certain way until I had my aha moment of this. Viola, once again, you're trying to show up to be seen. Let Annalise show up and be seen because sexy is different than sexual. Mm. Sexual is a part of who we are as people. Sexual doesn't always look like playboy playmate. Mm. Sexual doesn't even, humorous doesn't even look like a lot of comedies that you see on TV. Everybody's humor is different. Everyone's sexuality is different. And I knew, I was like, Viola, why don't you use your strengths as an actor and create some semblance of a person? Mm. So that dark skinned woman who's looking, you know, in the back row can see even some parts of herself, even in the midst of this melodrama. That's why I took off the wig. Yeah. I took the wig off because I said, if, if I take the wig off, if I take the eyelashes off and all the makeup off, then I would force the writers to write that. Exactly. I'm forcing you to write that because here's the thing, I'm gonna step out on a limb Come on. <laughs> you out here already. Yeah. <laughs> they do it for our white counterparts. Come on. There are a lot of white counterparts out there that do, you know, movies and listen, they're beautiful to me, but they probably wouldn't be considered classical beauties, but there's a category for them. Mm -hmm. We celebrate their humanity. That camera's in their eyes, watching everything that transpires. Mm -hmm. With us, we have to be reborn into an image that is pleasing, that is an answer to 450 years of racist policies. So it's gotta be this beautiful, image that is removed from trauma, pain, um, your face has got to be beat, the hair has got to be done, you know, right. and I'm just thinking, okay, if you do that, then what you're doing is you're saying that you're not a human being. Absolutely. Devoid of That's humanity. what you're saying. I didn't want to do that with Annalise. So I took the opportunity. Now, listen, there's, we killed a lot of people on this. <laughs> I lost how, I lost count how many people we killed. Y'all just killed like, a lot of people. Y'all killed a lot of people. We killed so and so. Yeah, yeah. When we kill him. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's right. I killed him. Yeah. <laughs> or you killed him. <laughs> killed a lot of people. But within all of that, I wanted to I can't inject some humanity. West, though. Yeah. I'm sorry. I just yeah. But. <laughs> So we have to wrap up. Yeah. We don't live here. <laughs> um, before we take questions from the audience, I have to ask you this question. In, in early in the book, you talk about um, being on set with Will Smith and him asking you this question. He asked you, um, Viola, who are you? And you... Uh, it was a big epiphany for you in the book, and you said, because you realized that you were, oh, I gotta put my glasses back on, I'm trying to be fancy, I'm sorry. You said, you realize that you will always be that little girl in the third grade, running from those boys after school, um, <clears throat> who just wanted to taunt you and harm you because you were black, and to them, black men ugly. I know and understand that feeling very deeply. Something about that moment you shared with Will really resonated with me, but it also didn't sit well with my spirit. Later in the book, you talk um, with a therapist who encouraged you to see the strength in little Viola, who was a survivor. She wasn't just a runner, she was, and she wasn't just a fighter, she was a survivor, and you acknowledged that. So the question I wanted to ask you, especially after reading this magnificent book, Finding me is, who else are you? Who else am I? Um, 
You know what? I, I thought to myself this, uh, this morning, because um, every, you know, Brene is right. <laughs> Gratefulness is the most vulnerable emotion. Because mm. as soon as you have a positive thought, a negative, negative one. one comes right. There are times, like this morning, that I think to myself, I'm extraordinarily brave. Mm. I am. I've jumped out of planes. I've I just jumped out. I jumped out of one plane. Okay. Um, <laughs> That's one more than me, so. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, you know, I survived a very traumatic and painful childhood. Mm. Um, and I still have a heart for people. Mm. I have not allowed it to make me bitter. I have not allowed it to shut me down. I still have humor. Mm. I'm always always, always thinking about what I can leave behind on this earth that's bigger than me. Always, every day. So I can say that. I do believe that I lead a life of integrity. Mm -hmm. um, and I do believe that God really specifically designed me. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, that Viola a lot of times is afraid. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of fear. A fear of being wrong, a fear of someone completely eviscerating me, <laughs> a fear of being found out. But just like that one moment when you are jumping out of a plane, um, what happens is you get on a very, very small plane <laughs> that is open, and I did it in Hawaii, and you're climbing up, 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 and you're thinking to yourself the same thoughts you probably would think before you die. <laughs> Except there's one thought that is not there, which is, why the fuck am I doing this? <laughs> right. But, but, you, but the more you ascend and you ascend and you ascend, the, the only thoughts that are there is either you jump or you don't. Mm -hmm. And then when the time comes, the person that you're doing it tandem with, you roll up the curtain, you lean back, and you just go for it. <sighs> Through all the fear, and all the pain, look at me, I'm gonna cry. It's okay, come on, take your time. Take your time. <laughs> You're supposed to bring tissue. I know, I'm like. Sorry, <laughs> Just, you can use my sleeve. <laughs> Through all the pain and the trauma. Thank you. Through it all, I'm not afraid to jump. Mm. I will tell you something that writing my book was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life outside of giving birth. Because, um, but, and I know this had to be difficult in a lot of ways, but you will absolutely allow so many other people to jump after they read this book. There's no question. I don't know many stories like yours, really. And I mean that 
and, and it's weird saying this because people have said so much to me and I, I felt so weird when people say stuff to me about my book, but I get it now because I've read your book. I just, I don't know many stories like yours. And seeing you and knowing you and looking at you, I'm just, I'm so amazed by who you are and who, who you've become knowing where you came from and what you came through. Um, you are a miracle. Amen. You are. Um, and, and the thing that I know that I learned is the more truth you tell yourself, the more freedom you gain. Yes, I believe that. And the more truth we tell ourselves and tell people, the more freedom we give them. And you have given us so much freedom in this book. So thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so we have some questions from the audience. I need the glasses again. Sorry. They're progressives, but they're not. They make us feel better by not calling them bifocals, but <laughs> let's see. Use as many of these as you. Oh, that's not a question. OK. <laughs> Flash round one, describe your. What? <laughs> Flash round one word to describe your following co stars. Well, I'm sorry. Who was your inspiration for Analyst Keating and How to Get Away with Murder? Well, I guess somebody else wrote Analyst yeah. Keating, so. Well, well my mom was a huge in inspiration, but that's not my mom. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, We're not doing too good so far. OK, I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> Oh, did writing and recording Cicely Tyson's memoir inspire you partially to share your story? Um, look at me. I'm thinking, I did Cicely Tyson. <laughs> um, yes, it did. Oh. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. OK, are you hoping to return to the stage soon? <laughs> Absolutely, if it's the right play. I gotta come. I, I oh, you man. know, I, I gotta come back with the right material. That would well this is sort of connected to that. What would be your dream role? You know, I have to say Head of Gobbler would be my dream role. Really? But only because it's hard. So there's <laughs> look at me. Now I'm saying this now. I don't think I really mean it. But there's a high rate of success, but a high rate of failure with that yeah. one. Oh, y'all shouldn't. I can't read some of these, y'all. I'm sorry. I'm just going to have to skip that. I'm sorry. What would you tell that young girl now if you could talk to her? Oh, my God. I would tell her that she was enough. Mm -hmm. I really would. I. Listen, I mean, the, mm -hmm. the, to go back to that. Yeah. I have had so many people ask me, and uh, uh, listen, there are, there are no dumb questions at all with me. You can ask me anything, seriously. But, <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, 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 you know, when people ask me about the poverty, mm -hmm. not being able to eat, bedwetting, going to school, smelling, shoddy plumbing, plumbing never worked, no phone, sometimes no heat or electricity. And then I'm asked, so why did that make you feel shameful? We're not gonna say stupid questions. You said no, no stupid questions. No, but, but, but what I'm saying is that to sift through all that shit and piss and brick and mortar to get to that little girl, to somehow grab a hold of her. I mean, grab her, hug her, look her in the eye and say, you are enough. Even if, even if you go to school tomorrow with those same pissy underwear and you still don't have anything to eat 
and you're still that chocolate girl that couldn't even moisturize your hair, you are still enough. That's right. Okay? That's right. That's right. That would have meant everything to me. Yeah. I want to ask you this question that somebody answered because I want to combine it with a question I have for you anyway. Mm -hmm. This this question says, talk about forgiveness. And I want to ask this because I didn't get a chance to ask you about your dad. And you, in, in the book, well, people may know some of this, but in the book, you talk about you, your dad in early early part of your life, um, you dealt with a lot of abuse. And not you personally, but your dad, um, your mom did at the hands of your dad. And your family obviously s- suffered because of that. But later on in life, you forgave him. And you had a wonderful relationship with him to the end of his life. Mm-hmm. Talk about forgiveness in general and that process of forgiveness. For I think forgiveness, just like faith, is the hardest thing to explain mm. to people. I mean, because there was a time, and I wrote the story in my book of when my dad came home and he was stabbed in the back by someone. And he, my mom took care of him all night and I stood there and I waited for him to die when I was six or seven years old. And I, I waited with bated breath. I thought if he were gone, that would make my life. But he didn't. He survived. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of abuse. I chose to forgive for me. Mm -hmm. I think that the weight of vengefulness, what you have to do to hold on to it, stops every bit of blessing that is going to come into your life. Because nobody wants to hear a 60-year-old woman in a therapist's office saying my bad marriage, me messing up my kid is all because of my dad. At some point, your life becomes yours. And the only person you can then save is yourself. You know, they, I keep saying this, they say forgiveness is giving up all hope of a different past. I couldn't transform my father into anything else. Listen, all I have is my life. I can't trade it in for another life. (laughs) It's all I have. I gotta figure it out. Forgiveness is one way of figuring it out. It's, It's sort of letting yourself out of a prison. And then watching my dad die which I could say is a privilege, but in the most deepest, painful way. There is no, everyone dies, and yet no one tells you how to sit with someone when they're dying. Oh, yeah. <sighs> And watching my mom sitting there crying over him and saying, Vala, the nurse told me that I need to tell your daddy to go, but I can't do it. I can't do it. And then I figured I had to do it. And he's holding his hand out to me and I'm telling him to go and that God loves him You're not thinking about the beatings. You're not thinking about the blood. You're not thinking that you're angry with them. The only thing you're thinking is, this part of your life is gone. It encapsulates it, right? So, I forgive to release my life. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why we carry 
everything from past generations into the next, into the next, into the next, because no one really examines anything. A lot of times they don't, they don't ever forgive. They just pass it on, they pass it on, they pass it on. Yeah. I do want levi to levitate when I die. Mm. I do wanna, don't want to leave any stones. Un I want to look under everything. <laughs> I do. And you know what? My father did something awesome. He made amends. Mm. And you know what? Life is hard. It is hard and sometimes it sucks. There is no such thing as a Brady Bunch. There is no <laughs> such thing as Leave it to Beaver. Sometimes you just look at shit and piss and really, I'm sorry, fucked up shit that happens. <laughs> and then that's what you're given in life. Amen. And you either look at it and you release it or you don't. I'm saying that I released it, okay? And now my life is mine with Julius, with Genesis, with May Alice, with you, Tarana, with everyone in the room. I could say that at least in my heart of hearts, when I held my father's hand mm. and told him that God loves him and I was going to take care of my mom, I really let him go. Amen. And I let it go. Amen. And I think that that's more of a boss ass move than Juilliard. Come on. Y'all got any more questions? <laughs> no, I was joking. Be quiet. Y'all can't be. You can't be yelling from the audience. So, I, 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 stop, stop. You have to put them on the card. Decorum. So, I think we've come to the end. <laughs> um. This has been an hour that has been one of the best hours of my life. Really. Really. I just... My, um, my, next, my next work, the work I'm working on, is about grace. Yeah. And you have taught me so much about grace. Just even tonight, talking to you, but reading this book, and you are not just graceful, but you are grace filled. And I just, I love you. I Thank love you. you too, sis. <laughs>